Okay, so good morning, everyone. Good morning. This makes the morning much better, by the way. Highly recommended. Um, it's the color of coffee, but better ingredients. Um, sexy defense is our next talk, uh, and my I'm I'm really privileged to go after Raf, who basically covered half of my talk. So. Uh, um, I'll try to blow through the boring slides, or at least the, the stuff that, that Raf talks about. And uh, I obviously don't agree to anything he says. No, I just. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I have some disagreements, but he got a few points right, so <laughs> uh, he's doing something right. This is what we're going to go through a little bit of uh, uh, background. Um, the thing that started this was actually all right, so you got a red team test. and they blew your thing completely open. I mean, the original title for this talk was, so the red team was here and tore you a new one. Now what? Uh, but certain conferences asked me to kind of tone it down. So we managed with uh, maximizing the home field advantage. Um, so again, the background for this talk, uh, and then basically going through a methodology that at least I found, again, disclaimer, just me, uh, to be somewhat effective. <laughs> In, in defense as opposed to what most people are practicing. And, and again, Ralph's talk kind of goes through that uh, in demonstrating how, how bad we suck at it. Uh, the methodology, we're going to go through map, mapping correlation and actually taking action as a defender. I know. Um, we'll go through some examples uh, that I actually had a, an opportunity to, to help run uh, for companies that we help defend and the ob uh, obligatory conclusion. So really quickly, this is me, uh, Ian Amit. I'm not certified to really do anything, um, <laughs> which keeps my LinkedIn title really short. It's just my name. Uh, I know, it's weird. I'm used to all those. <sighs> yeah. Um, I'm, I've been in the business for over 15 years now. Uh, I'm at the stage where we start counting in, in fives. So over a decade, over 15 years, and yeah. <laughs> uh, currently working for, for IOActive as director of services, running uh, EMEA, uh, which is kind of hectic and fun. I'm a hacker by trade, I would say, researcher uh, by nature, uh, a really bad developer. Uh, I can probably go work for, uh, for like DRM companies because my code works on my machine, and that's about it. <laughs> uh, so it's the best software protection ever. Um, my research in the past used to focus a lot on cybercrime. Um, I used to work with, with companies that had to deal with it uh, in the security business. Um, I've covered both the technical aspects as well as the business elements of cybercrime, which led me to more research uh, that focused on cyber warfare. Um, if, you're, if you're allergic to the word cyber, I'm sorry, it's just we don't have alternatives <laughs> in this industry. Um, so we cover, I cover, kind of cover the links between cybercrime and cyber warfare and nation states and criminal activities. It's, it's all fun uh, and gets you to, to special places sometimes. In the spare time that I do have between all of that, um, I've set up the, the local DEF CON group in Tel Aviv, uh, the DCG9723. Um, I'm one of the founders for the PTES. Anyone is not familiar with the pen testing execution standard? You all know it. Okay, that's fine. Go read about it. Uh, it basically covers everything that I'm saying here, everything that Raf said, and beyond. Uh, and I'm, I can say that because I didn't write it. I, I just managed to get a lot of smart people around me to help set up this thing, which is basically a manual, or, or again, it's a methodology for how to run proper pen testing from end to end. Not just run Nessus, click, 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 uh, report, change the logo on the report, and, and say, well, we've got a consulting company, uh, but actually do the right thing. And the rest of the spare time, I'm still, uh, I'm still serving uh, as a reservist in the Israeli Air Force doing computer stuff. And of course, uh, we're all dirty security. It's an unaffiliated group of, of crazy people doing security stuff. Uh, so some background. As I stated before, I'm, I'm mostly an attacker. Right? This is what I do. I do pen testing. I do a lot of red team testing. Uh, I, I break stuff. I break into stuff, break out of stuff sometimes. Uh, 
So what the hell am I doing here talking about defense? It's like the most boring topic ever. Well, not necessarily. Um, a lot of times I run into situations where I'm working with companies and all right, so they, they got a vulnerability assessment done. And they kind of feel good about it because they filled in some check boxes. Uh, and maybe they even passed a, a pen test, which is supposedly more than just a vulnerability assessment. Uh, and that, that really got them somewhere, right? No, it, re it got them, again, more check boxes. It got them compliant, excellent. Um, but really didn't get them anywhere on the security posture. As, as Ralph said, it got them this thick book of a report that's gathering dust somewhere, right along other thick books of reports from previous years that no one has ever touched or, or done anything about because everything changes. All right? if, you're, if you're watching House or watched House, he says everybody lies. All right? In our business, not only everybody lies, but everything changes. So you're being lied to about stuff that's not already there. Good luck defending it. <laughs> then sometimes you actually have a red team test. Right? Raf talked about uh, those few brave companies that actually you know, take, the, the, take the leap of faith and get a full scope test or a red team test. Uh, and then they really realize that things are really screwed up. I mean, everything is owned. Um, and it's funny because it's, it's, you know, I've been doing this for years now and I'm, I'm, I've tried to recognize or kind of identify what are the reactions after the first red team test. Uh, so they usually go through, no, <laughs> it can't be. We passed a pen test before that. <laughs> Everything was, was fine. And then they're like, no, nah, this, this, this must be something, something's wrong. This is not my data that you just gave me. On, on, on a CD or a USB stick, the, 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 you're doing something wrong. You're doing something really wrong. You're not playing by the rules, okay? Because the pen tester had a time frame and a scope and limitations. You're, you clearly did not pay by, by the rules. You just, I mean, you broke into this place or you talked your way into here and, or you tailgated or whatever it is. Or you to our, to our Wi-Fi network from the outside and you're not playing by the rules. Um, no, and, and then it, it's like, so it, 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 it's not relevant, right? Because you didn't play by the rules, there's no point of, of addressing some of those things that, that you raised in the, in, the, in the Red Team report. So we're good. And once every blue moon, you get, all right, you know what? You're absolutely right. I see all those results. I can identify the gaps between my current posture and what you're, uh, what you're demonstrated here. Uh, I'm going to focus on the assets that, that are critical to me and that you know, the, the, the risk analysis shows they, they bear the, the most value and we're going to fix stuff and everything's going to work fine. Correct? So that, that really never happens. Um, when I try to fix that or, or what happens afterwards uh, is I usually say, you know what, that's great. We, we ran the red team. Uh, we've, got, we've got a lot of data, but you have much more data. That's actually relevant. And you know what? Look behind you. All those books, I want them because they are relevant. Uh, so we usually start by reading ad reports. <laughs> um, again, they contain a lot of valuable information that you need to, uh, to sift through it and pick the, the relevant stuff. So this is going to be a boring five minutes because you need to be able to speak a certain vocabulary, terminology, because that's what's going to give, give you the funding for, the, for your actual security posture or, or strategy. Uh, so this is kind of, again, pick your vocabulary, pick your terminology as long as it's consistent and you can defend it. This is what we usually use. Uh, we talk about availabilities, exposures, threats, risks, uh, and yes, you have to be able to suit up and defend it and present it coherently without saying bits and bytes to, uh, to C-level executives. So vulnerabilities, uh, as we all like to call them, they're, they're usually associated with software. Wrong. Okay? Again, people, processes, technology. Technology comes last. Vulnerabilities exist in everything in people and processes as well. So 
start by identifying the stuff that you already have. All those books have vulnerabilities in software, but don't forget to also look at processes and people, because that's what your business actually does. Right? No single business on the planet makes money just from the technology it runs. Okay? There is something, some magic powder around the business that, that causes it to make money. It's not just the software. Exposures. Vulnerabilities do not live in thin air. Um, an exposure is basically what connects a vulnerability with a threat model. Someone needs to want to break into the business and exploit a vulnerability. Uh, that connection is what we call exposure, um, which leads us to the threat. This is something that uh, I, I don't think that, that even RAF covered this in, in, in much detail. We're not looking just at, at, in, at the security of a business, again, independently in a void. There's someone that's out there to get us. Uh, and, and Raf, again, the, thank you for, for sitting here and, <laughs> and kind of <laughs> raising this up. Uh, you did touch a little bit about you know, the script kit is and kind of the classification of who might use this uh, to, to break into the business, but this should be first. When you build, when you want to defend yourself, the first thing you do is build a threat model. Okay? And a threat model contains your, anyone who might want to break into the business. Anyone who might want to cause damage to the business. It could be internal or external, external elements. Could be employees, partners, competitors, third parties, nation states, criminal organizations, random people. They all need to be classified and identified Right? and fit into the model. And, and an easy way to do that is to provide them with attributes of capabilities. Right? The capabilities of a script kitty is different, hopefully, than from, from someone who's sitting here, which is different from a, an internal employee that might not be technical, but is privy to a lot of information on how the business works. Uh, and classified by accessibility to assets, because we're talking about the business assets. Again, processes, people, technology and how accessible these are to the threat actors or threat communities. Which leads us to, to what all the alphabet soup masters uh, are, are uh, taught in the first day of school, risk. Um, and I like to look at risk from a mathematical perspective. Why? Because I'm an engineer. <laughs> uh, and you need to be able to express risk consistently over time with variables that are changing over time. Again, this is a business, everything changes and everybody lies. So you need to be able to have a formula that actually adapts and makes sense. Uh, for me, the uh, risk is, is a probability. Again, it's a mathematical term. Uh, it's a probability of something bad happening to the business. All right, take it whatever you want, whatever works for you. Um, and yes, and, and, and express it in a way that mixes up all the threat model that we've talked about before uh, into something that you can easily use to rate things in terms of how risky they are, right? How risky is this process? How risky is this operation? What's the risk associated with a, with a certain asset in, in, in my business? Which leads us to the actual methodology, right? Now we've got the terminology done. We know how to express things. Let's take a look at how we've been doing things defensively for a very, very, very long time. So. We started with this, and we're unfortunately still kind of stuck with this, okay? Uh, this is the defender view, uh, and there are a lot of these around here, which, which is awesome, I love it. <laughs> uh, and as you can see, the defender view is kind of obscured by all the defenses that they actually put up, all right? So I'm looking for attackers that are gonna come from this specific angle, and, but when they do, <laughs> they better be ready, you're kind of going to fire little arrows at them. Um, but again, my, my defenses, my walls, my firewalls, my AV products, IDSs, IPSs are actually obscuring my view of where the attacks are, are coming from. Uh, whether mentally, all right, because I trust these. I've paid hundreds of thousands of dollars <laughs> to all those nice vendors to put their blinking lights there and to charge me uh, over and over and over again. So I, I have to feel good about it. Otherwise, 
what the hell am I doing? Uh, or physically, okay, they're actually obscuring my view. The firewalls that I've put are blocking a lot of the traffic that I might have an interest in uh, and I might have, you know, misplaced some of my sensors inside instead of outside to look, to be able to look at more stuff. On the other hand, this is what the attacker sees and still sees, okay? He is not bound by any rules. I can come and go as I will. I don't have to have any accessibility to, act to the actual asset before I actually try to lay hands on it. I can study it over time. I have a perfect unobscured view of what's happening. I can uh, inspect it and see what's going on and can see when the guards are leaving their, their little arrow slits uh, and go to the pub. And, uh, and talk to them and kind of understand when the shift change and, and what's the suckiest shift and, and where's the, the most obscure view um, and plan my attack in a way that the defender doesn't even know that I'm planning, that I'm reconnaissing uh, it. And this is how it, how it looks from a, from a Visio perspective. <laughs> um, this is the attacker perspective, uh, the, the attacker scope as I like to, to call it. Uh, and this is shamelessly stolen from, from the pen testing execution standard. This is the kind of the phases that attackers go through. Uh, they're not even touching, not a single packet is sent to the targeted organization until it comes to exploitation. So I have two full phases of intelligence gathering that I can do completely passively without anyone knowing. I can do vulnerability research on the software that I know that that organization bought because the vendor bragged about selling him this multi hundred thousand dollar deal of products. So I know now exactly what software they're using, what version, where they installed it. Um, just look at Pastebin and look for, for the engineering notes on, on <laughs> what, I, what issues they had installing them, go to the forums, learn about their configurations, and start disassembling the software and figuring out where it's broken. And then they go through exploitation, establishing control, and then post exploitation, bringing all the the data out, uh, and a month later, uh, someone, someone releases a signature and, and tells them they've been fucked for two months. Uh, this is <laughs> what the attacker, uh, sorry, the defender scope is and still is. And again, this is what we've been practicing for the past 20 years. We're doing detection, not really good. Again, it, it will tell you sometime, sometime that you have been breached. Anywhere between 30 minutes was, wow, man, you went out there. <laughs> 30 days to a few months <laughs> ago that you were actually breached. And they found a zero day in your network right now because they just updated the signature. Uh, and then mitigation and containment, which is really important because in my mind, you need to operate in a state of mind that says we are in constant breach. Everything is broken and we're just trying to maintain or to sustain or to stay resilient in light of such a breach, okay? Uh, you need to be able to work in a cont contaminated environment and keep working in it, right? Talk to, talk to control engineers, right? To industrial contro control engineers, this is what they do on a daily basis. This is way harder than software security, trust me. And this is what we're missing. Uh, and I'm going to try to kind of fill in with, with this sex defense approach. We're missing threat modeling, as, as I've explained in the beginning. We're missing this greatly. If the attacker has the opportunity to do intel gathering on me, why shouldn't I be able to do intel gathering on my attackers since I have a threat model and I know who they are? or at least I know the groups uh, of, of threat actors that may target me. Uh, we're missing a lot of data correlation, and again, Raf uh, brought up a, a great point. As a vendor, I do expect HP to come up with this magic appliance that kind of, you can feed all the stuff to it, and then it correlates everything and give you a pretty picture of, of everything that was happening. Uh, so yes, I want to turn on uh, user audits, user uh, action uh, logs on every device because I can use that data, right, to track down behavior over time and model it and do fantastic things on it. Um, but you do have a lot of data that you could use before you actually do detection. 
And I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, uh, push the, the boundary a little bit and say, yes, we're, we're not just trying to detect better or detect sooner, we're actually trying to detect intent. All right, I'm, I'm, my goal is to try to identify the attack before it occurs, so I can brace myself. Going back to the fight club uh, analogy, yes, you are in the fight club. And yes, you, you, you have no idea what it is to be in a fight until you've got the first punch in your face, and you still need to stand there and, and punch back. Because you can read all about it and see movies and, and talk to people and think that you're prepared and go on to the fight, and then you're going to get punched in the nose, and one or two things are going to happen. You either brace up and actually fight back, or you crawl up you know, in, in, on the floor and cry mommy. And we're mostly crying mommy at this point, again, based on, on, on a little bit of red teaming experience. And you have to remember, this is hard. This is not a practice that's easy for defenders because it's not about egos, which we have a lot here, trust me. It's not about people, all right? It's not about just hiring the best defender that you have. It's not about hiring the best hacker. Uh, that, that you can get because that's, it, it, doesn't ma it doesn't matter. We're protecting businesses, not technology. And it's not about the skills. Uh, it's about the fact that it's not fair. All right? We're not playing by the rules. So we need to come up with ways to, that will allow us to interpret rules a little different or expand our way of thinking and find rules that can accommodate what we're trying to do here as a business that's defending itself. Right? It's about the mindset of having constant improvement, of understanding that, yes, I am breached at any point in time, and I need to deal with it effectively. Right? There's no perfect. I will agree with that. And there's never going to be perfect. So there are always gaps. You need to be able to identify and remediate and to act upon them in the context of risk. Now, again, we're going back to the terminology. To identify that risk, the first thing you need to do is know what you're protecting. To know what you're protecting, you need to be able to map. Mapping is, has been one of the uh, trickiest problems over decades. It still is. I don't trust any video that I've, I'm, I'm given you know, before a pen test or an engagement because it's all bullshit. Um, I like to put everyone in, in the same room and have them explain one by one how their network really is. And it's, it's just fascinating to watch all those people argue between themselves. <laughs> no, this, this, we've changed this. We've moved that rack. We installed a new thing. There, we actually have a, a you know, dark fiber connection to a new data center somewhere. And they're like, what? <laughs> so yes, mapping is critical. And yes, actually going to a patch panel and tracking cable by cable to understand, huh, that's not supposed to be here. And that's connecting this separate network to this network that has internet access. Because at one point, someone on that network needed uh, to download like a big bunch of patches. And they just, oh, that's close. We have a spur cable here, bam, bam, and forgot to detach it. Um, I was investigating an incident sometime in the past with, with a semi somewhat government organization, where we actually lifted the raised floor to find where the hell is this you know, command control, like military command control network that's not supposed to have any connection to the outside world, uh, is getting DHCP addresses that can connect it to the internet. Uh, and we, we found you know, a patch cable running between a, a DSL router that's used you know, specifically for a specific station to have internet access. Uh, that connected it to the local network because, again, someone needed internet and you know, couldn't go through the process of, of downloading on a specific machine and then getting information and so on and so forth. And again, mapping is important, uh, but, but I'm jumping ahead of myself, right, because I focused on technology. Wrong. Mapping starts with assets. What makes this business tick? What makes this business make money to pay your salary? and then kind of go into the processes, the people, and then the technology. And then at the end, this is where we disagree, only then 
you map out your security assets. What did my successors or, or predecessors do and fucked up um, by putting all this technology around to defend me, um, but I do have it now, so how can I use it? Or at least map it to my, to my advantage. Uh, and then, on top of that kind of basic mapping of what my organization is, and this, again, this is a fascinating exercise, uh, I can actually put in all the results of the vulnerabilities and, and the threats and, and, and everything around it to create a picture of, okay, this is where we start from. Uh, and it may look like this. I've, I've, I've tried to kind of redact a couple of, of threat models that we did in the past, but they're just too specific, so uh, I invented this on Visio. <laughs> um, and again, the, this can be on paper, this can be in your, in your head, preferably you know, with, with a dump option to something that's more sustainable. Um, but it's important to put it and formalize it uh, in a way that it includes critical assets, Okay, again, could be people, could be processes, could be uh, data elements, could be infrastructure. The mapping should include the processes themselves, everything that's related, third parties, uh, vulnerabilities that are mapped onto this, all right, and how they relate to the critical assets. And this is something that you can actually start working with as a defender because you're no longer bound by, so we're put a firewall here and AVs on all the machines and we're done, right? Because that's what we do now. Uh, at this point you can say, all right, these are my critical assets. I'm gonna start defending them first because I don't give a fuck if this system goes down, all right? It costs me, it may cost me $10,000, but my defenses are cost me $100,000. No point, all right? Just re-image it. <clears throat> so we talked about mapping threats. I'm not gonna go over this. Um, we talked a little bit about gathering logs. Again, I'm not gonna go over it because HP is gonna come up with this magic solution. <laughs> I'm gonna hold it to you. <laughs> um, in my mind, you need to be able at some point to just correlate everything. All right, all the logs that you've gained don't throw away anything. And, and with this, they are right. Storage is cheap. It's the best investment that you can make in your security strategy, okay, in your security posture. Just dump everything onto some storage, all right? Don't, don't try to normalize it and prettify it or filter it, just dump everything because you will have stuff that may be relevant, if not now, in a month or two months uh, and that may be kind of connected back to an event uh, or to a threat that, that's starting to, to affect you. And gather intelligence. Intelligence can come from many, many different places. Uh, it's not a dirty word. It's, you know, it's not just you know, some crazy militant guys trying to, to, uh, to spy on your enemies. It can come from marketing. I love those people. And sales, because they are the out, outbound facing Inter interfaces for the organization and they know a lot. They meet a lot of people, they interact with lots of companies and analysts and stuff like that. So talk to them. Understand what are their challenges. Who's, who is it that we're competing with? All right, is it HP, is it EMC, is it Dell, is it SecureWorks, I don't know. Find out what's the landscape so you can map it back into your model. Um, competitors, might be a good source of intelligence. In a lot of industries, you will find out that although you might be competing you know, on every freaking deal out there, and the salespeople are, are really, really, well, ready to kill each other, while the techies on the back end are sharing notes and, and kind of ideas, and, and, and again, this is, what, this is what we're doing here, okay? Um, so find the right channels to talk to your competitors and partners and customers and analysts. And it goes on to the trivial, you know, the certs that are pushing out information. Um, market news are, are a critical source of raw intelligence, okay? Everyone in the security industry is gonna tell you that we have a cycle. We, have, we actually have a schedule for the whole 12 months ahead of us because we have the Olympics, we have NCAA, we have 
elections, we have all sorts of events that we all know that if we Google a certain term at a certain time, all right, at least one of the first 10 results in Google is going to be malicious. Why? Because that's how our threat communities work. They know how we operate and they know what we're looking for. So this is critical. If Prince Harry is deciding to have a nude pool session in his Vegas suite, yeah, that might not have been on the schedule, but you know what? Let's adapt to it and, and make sure that we're protected from nude Prince Harry. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't make sense. Um, and the last one is forums. Forums uh, could be Google Groups uh, for specific pieces of software. It could be hacker forums that you need to uh, go to and, and learn what your threat communities are talking about. All right, what tools they're using. Again, fill in the blanks so you can actually use them in preparation for that attack. People. People are breakable more than software. Um, I, I, do, I do have one disagreement with you, Raf. I do think that, that you and I can build the perfect secure network. Exclude the users? Exactly. <laughs> See, he's with me. But the second I put the first user on it, it's broken. Okay? Uh, now think about an enterprise network <laughs> with tens of thousands of idiots using it. Okay? <laughs> we're bound to fail and we're bound to operate in, contain, in contaminated environments. That's what I was saying at the beginning. Uh, but use the users. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just the, the harsh truth. Use your users, and at some point, yes, you will be able to educate them, to raise their awareness level where they would talk to you. And the key word is talking, because you need to be able to communicate with people, not just IRC channels. Um, and get that information, all right? Users that come up and say, you know what? I've seen something strange is priceless. When you get to that point, you're like, yes, did something good today. Uh, because it may be insignificant for them, it may be critical for you. Uh, and it all boils, boils down to awareness and, and, and again, it's people hacking. It's, it's giving them or, or providing them the tools uh, that they may not even know are security tools to deal with issues like this. And again, this is, oops, this is the, the infamous product. Correlate all the things, everything. Logs, news pieces, and this is hard because this is unstructured data coming from multiple places that needs to be correlated over, over different timelines to make some kind of sense in terms of a threat. So I can see a threat kind of percolating from here and I can see a oh, sales call volume going up and inquiries. And, and I don't know, user behavior on the network starting to be funky or to kind of exceed some kind of baseline. And I need to correlate that with other things that may justify it, all right? Maybe I'm changing, I'm installing new software, so my user behavior should change. So this is hard. <laughs> Raf is like, oh fuck, what did I do? <laughs> it's really hard. Hey, we're not here just to, you know, to run Nessus and, and Metasploit, right? And then you can act. Once you get, I mean, this is hard, but, but I, I can tell you that we do have, you know, kludgy scripts and kind of Hadoop clusters that, that we, we kick data into, what, no? Yeah, it's broken, I know, it's not, pro it, it's not production ready, but it works better than the fucking RD, our relational databases. But, you know, we, we can get to a point where we can build very specific systems for very specific customers to correlate all sorts of data and make sense out of it to a point where we can act upon it, all right? And act defensively is something, again, new. It's not buying a new firewall and actually installing it. <laughs> it's acting defensively in preparation for a threat that I know is coming, all right? Uh, and again, this is hard, but, but this is where it gets sexy. Um, training. Again, the people. Combining technology into the mix after 
you did all the prep work. After you have a model that you did not sign off. Okay, we'll talk about that. Uh, and working with others. Because if you just try to stand it by yourself, you're fucked. No point. Um, and again, it's about assessing where you are, pen testing, red teaming, to validate all your assumptions that you did on paper right now, all right? And, and again, you interacted with a lot of people that lied to you about all sorts of things. Uh, so again, you, you need to validate that this is actually true um, and actually make sense over time. Never sign off on your security strategy. Once you have it and you print it, it's obsolete. So make sure that whatever security strategy you create is flexible enough to be able to adapt to the changes in your business. And again, changes in your business means business, people, processes, and then technology. Everything will change because the business needs to make money. And once you got to a point where you can make money, again, it's irrelevant because the market's going to chase after you. So you need to innovate and find new ways to make more money. Hence, everything changes. You need, you need to be able to support. I'm going to Let's get cut down to the chase, all right? Once you act, and again, the focus of this talk is the act part of sexy defense, of, of, of acting on, on defense. Um, it's all about counterintelligence because you have a map, you know who your aggressors are, you have gathered some kind of intelligence on them, and now you know that winter is coming, okay? <laughs> um, you know that someone is out there to get you, either because they just attacked your competitor and you're in the same industry segment, uh, because someone released a bajillion UUIDs from Apple and you're running a big Apple shop and you're like, okay, brace up. Um, or whatever reason that you know, got you to a point where you've gathered enough intelligence and you have a threat model that says you should be ready. How do you do anything about it other than sit in the corner and wait, wait for the blink of lights to turn red to tell you that you've been you know, breached for 30 days or minutes? The secret is here. It's your information. It's your business. And this is exactly the, that home field advantage. Own up to it. Okay? No, don't make critical changes that are going to screw up the, the business itself. But work with the business to create traps. Okay, and again, it sounds very medieval. <laughs> we're, we're setting traps in the moat, so, or, or we're, we're talking to the next village and poisoning the well, so when they take over it, they're going to die, or whatever it is. But set traps in, in a business is easy. You're using intelligence and you're using technology in ways that are innovative and will allow you to respond, because if anyone touches that trap, it's not someone from the inside. Or maybe it is, but they shouldn't touch that trap. And it could be, you know, it could be a, a document that, that you fake and put in, in some file share. It could be a system, a honeypot, that you set up in the perimeter, on the inside. It could be a news item that you release through, you know, some obscure PR channel. And, and kind of do, you know, Push from one end and try to see what the reaction is, all right? Or kind of try, try to trace back what, what happens after this, this thing is released. You'll find amazing things on your own business, all right? Try to set those, try to set those documents. It's, it's, it's a fascinating experience in, in counterintelligence. And then you can booby trap tools, all right? You can work with law enforcement. You can get a little more, uh, and again, it sounds right that it's illegal. We, ha we are bound by legal terms when we do defense, but, and the attackers are not. Well, law is hackable. Once you dig into it, you figure that all those laws are written in, in context-free grammar, okay? Makes more sense. And they're hackable, and they have vulnerabilities that can be exploited. So find a lawyer, I'm not one, and get legal advice 
and find the right lawyers that when you tell them, look, this is what I want to do, they're not just like, blah, 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 I didn't hear you. <laughs> they're like, no, you can't do that. And then you start explaining to them, well, this, this is what I'm trying to do. And then they're like, well, you can't do that here, but we have this company, <laughs> uh, or we can set up this company in some remote island, and whatever it is, try to find the right legal framework uh, that will allow you to be a little more proactive in your defenses. Here are a couple of examples that, uh, again, from my experience in counterintelligence and, and, and working on the defensive side, brought us to a much better situation defensively. The first one, <clears throat> uh, we've identified the, the threat communities and their hangouts, all right? Where they were talking about their, their exploits, their tools, um, what they did, and we infiltrated into that. All right, uh, so we can get that information as well. At that point, is it's fairly passive. Uh, but if you can get into those forums, and it's easy because it's the internet, and you, you know, I can be a cat, I can be a dog, I can be, you know, a Chinese hacker or or whatever it is, a rabbit. <laughs> um, I can get into those forums. Uh, I can participate in them a little more actively up to a point where I can manipulate stuff, okay? Stuff can be software that they're releasing, um, could be anything, backdoor it, make sure it leaves a distinct signature, um, and then I can actually update my defensive mechanisms to identify this distinct signature, so when I'm attacked, it's like, perfect. I know exactly what's going on. Um, so this is, this is uh, the actual forum that uh, was the hangout for those uh, threat communities that we were, uh, were discussing. And this is one of the posts that, that was of interest to, to my customer. Um, someone was releasing a, a, a rat. It's one, you know, another one of those rats, full access, remote control, blah, 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 blah. Um, works 100% on Windows 7, Vista, XPS 3.3, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it looks good, you know, it's got a GUI, click, 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 and you own, and perfect, okay? Uh, it may seem a little script kitty or stupid, but, but again, it's, this is really a secret. Sometimes nation states use those tools as well. Um, <laughs> so our... People that, that I know, Going to us, okay? And I'm going to put a rat in your rat and re-release it, and then see who downloads it and uses it, so I can see what they're doing. Um, we didn't get permission to 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 show you what we did here, so I'm, I'm going to show you a demo on something else uh, that we did a little later on. Uh, Dark Comet. Anyone? Everyone? Anyone knows what Dark Comet is? Yes. Anyone can get a recent version of Dark Comet? Good. Dark Comet was a, is a rat, um, a pretty cool one, a very old one. And the developer of Dark Comet decided to pull off development and, and just basically pull down the website because at some point, a nation state was using this to track dissidents within the state. Okay? I'm not gonna name names, but if you can read, at that point, I was like, huh, people are going to miss it because it's, it became kind of infamous. It was very effective, very useful. I bet you people are going to start looking for it. It's like, hey, do you have a recent version of Doc Comet <laughs> on all those forums? Uh, and at that point, we're like, okay, yes, we have a recent version of Doc Comet and we can post it to the forum. And this is what we did. Uh, this is, again, a demonstration. It has nothing to do with what we actually did. Um, this is Dark Comet. This is, again, plain vanilla. Download it when it was still available. Unzip it, and this is what you have. It's working properly and all. <clears throat> and what we're, what we're about to do here is we have pre prepared a interpreter 
executable. Okay, I'm an interpreter shell, and what we're going to use is a lusty binder which comes with dark comment. Basically, binds a number of executables or files together into a new executable and runs them one by one. Uh, so we're, we took mtp.exe, which is an interpreter, and dark comet. Um, we're going to make sure that it, the new executable is going to have the dark comet icon, so it looks exactly like dark comet. And we're going to bind them together to a new executable called dark comet underscore. And this is what we're going to have, uh, what we're going to release back to a certain forum where people are talking about, ooh, we missed our comment. I wish there was like a recent version of it. Because um, you know someone's going to click it. Okay, again, it boils down to users. So this is our new dark comment, which will run and we'll see that it operates exactly as old dark comment did. Besides the fact that our interpreter uh, listener, on the other hand, is waiting for that interpreter shell that we bound to dark comet. I'm saying dark comet as much as I'm saying cyber in previous talks. Uh, so again, this is dark comet. This is our version. It's running. It's fully functional. It's it's just as as effective as it was before. Uh, while we as defenders are getting access to the system of whoever downloaded this nasty tool and is out there to get us because we released it in a very specific forum that we know that our threat communities are using. Okay? This is what I call counterintelligence. Questions? Lawyers in the crowd? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Law enforcement people in the crowd? <laughs> Yeah, uh, and again, you, multiple examples. This is another forum. This one's in Spanish, so it's easier to read than, than Arabic, I, I presume. Uh, this is a keylogger. Again, you can do funny stuff with it. Um, this, is, this is my favorite example. This is a cryptor, a fudder. Anyone for working for a Navy company? Used to. Used to. All right, Navy companies hate this, okay? Uh, because it, 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 it really blows out all, all their secrets. AV doesn't work. For real. I mean, it works for, for the banks and stuff like that. But um, a crypto fodder is basically, you know, Dark Comet as it is, if you just try to use it, everyone detects it because everyone knows about Dark Comet. Uh, but if you want to uh, install it on someone, uh, someone's machine that, that actually has an updated AV, you need, you need to, to FUD it. FUD is, is fully undetectable. You have multiple cryptos like this. Uh, this one claims to be 100% FUD output, which is a lie. Again, people lie. Uh, this one actually was producing binaries that were detected by two or three different antiviruses. So what we did here, we downloaded it, okay? And in this specific incident, this poster is, is, is really interesting because, how should I put it? We could modify this post, okay? So we downloaded this changed it in ways that we'll see in a second, and then uploaded it again to Mediafire and changed the link here to the version that we modified. Make sense? So this is what we did there. Um, first of all, we needed to enhance it because it was still detecting, uh, two antiviruses were still detecting. So we had to fix the logic of the cryptor to make it fully undetectable. This is where antiviruses are like, what, you did what? It's like, oh, no, 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 bear with me, wait. <laughs> um, and then we made sure it leaves a very distinct signature on every freaking binary it produces. Okay, sounds better now? And then we released it back to the forum so that when it's used to produce undetectable binaries, we can detect them because we have the custom signature on our IDS. Uh, in this case, this was, this was completely under NDA and I couldn't get the fucker to release it. So this is, this is just an example of how you would go about doing something similar. Um, here we're using Rogue Cryptor, uh, which you know, we're just going to take uh, PuTTY, for example, uh, encrypt it. The encrypted result is fully, functional, uh, fully functioning. The only thing is that it's, like it's not PuTTY, or it doesn't look like PuTTY uh, from a binary perspective. So this is the encrypted PuTTY. It's fully functional. It's working. Um, and what, what we're going to show here is a version 
that was rigged uh, by our modified cryptor. And our modified cryptor, what it does on top of crypting the, the, the input is it finds, it basically finds a code cave in, in the resulting executable, a section of the code of the, the binary executable that is never going to get executed. And it implants a signature in it, all right? Just an ASCII string of I'm right here in this case, okay? And again, this is kind of gangster. If, if you want to be correct, you, you get a few knobs before here and put a jump. So, you know, if, if by accident something gets to this point, it will just, you know, not do anything or at least not break completely. Um, and again, if we, if we look at the, the actual CPU uh, run thread, we'll see that it's, it's an area of the code that never, get, never gets accessed. And we have our signature here. Um, so all we have to do now is get that string of, of, uh, of hex and use it in our IDS, which we'll see in a second. Now what we're doing here is I'm gonna, I've already placed the two different binaries, okay, on a web server. I'm gonna download them both <coughs> just to generate the traffic so we can have like a PCAP of both binaries being transferred through the network. Um, this is funny. It's not commonly downloaded. Of course it's not. It's been encrypted. It's, <laughs> it's never been seen before. Uh, so it's, it, this is not actually a, you know, an AV prompt. This is just Internet Explorer being anal. At this point we have the PCAPs for, for both downloads. Uh, we have a snort rule that basically has that, those uh, string of, of uh, binary bits. And we're going to run the original PCAP, which is the, just a crypted version from the original encryptor versus the rigged version. Okay? Again, this is, these are the lo local rules. We've got company is the, is the message that I want to get. I'm looking for roll bytes uh, in anywhere in the content of, of the stream. Uh, here's our snort running on the original one. It's all clear. Okay? Whereas if we run it on the crypted, on the rigged one, I get an alert. Okay? So this is kind of nifty because we've just released a cryptor. We did something really bad. We released a cryptor to the world and we modified it. Ooh. Um, but it actually is giving us counterintelligence on people using it or at least giving me a broader spectrum to work with because I don't have to wait for the AV to detect, you know, to create a signature for the cryptor that we know is working correctly, I have my signature. I have a zero day signature of the cryptor that I re-released back to the forum where my threat community is operating. That's what I call counterintelligence. Again, I'm really happy that there are no lawyers in, in the crowd because this could go on, you know, shoot off to a, to a legal discussion, um, which, which it should. Okay, because again, law is hackable. Uh, don't just think, oh, this guy's crazy. Some, some fucked up Israeli with, you know, whatever know what, what laws they run over there. No, I work for an American company. I work with big clients worldwide. Um, and, and they understand that law is ha hackable. Or at least I can find the lawyers that are happy enough to kind of um, you know, roll their, their sleeves and look into international law and corporate law of, of all sorts of places and find the right frameworks to, to counter intelligence or, or to run defense more, uh, more effectively. Uh, the, the greatest example uh, that, that at least in my mind exists is Microsoft. Microsoft has badass lawyers, all right? They were able to gain access and modify and interact with hundreds of thousands of systems worldwide using trademark infringement claims. How awesome is that? All right? And this is basically what they did in shutting down Brito Lab. All right? In conjunction with Shadow Server and, and the, the National High Tech Crime Unit in, in the Netherlands and, and a few other organizations, they basically shut down multiple command control servers worldwide for Brito Lab. Uh, pointed, forced an update on 
I think it was actually millions, not just hundreds of thousands, correct me if I'm wrong, but millions of systems worldwide forcefully pushed a patch on it. All right, this is unheard of. This is remote code execution, guys, uh, under trademark infringement claims. This was under a clandestine kind of bulletproof you know, claim by the lawyer. They got approval from federal government, state governments, and, and several governments outside of the US. I know it's, it's crazy. Um, so again, it's, it's doable, law is hackable, find the right channels to do it through. How much time do I have? Other elements that you can use in your counterintelligence. Um, anyone knows what Kipo is? Awesome. Kipo is, is phenomenal. It's basically a honeypot. It's an interactive honeypot simulating a Linux environment. Um, if, you, if you run Linux in your infrastructure, use it. If you don't, please don't use it. It's, it's just going to confuse you and the attackers. Um, <laughs> it's an awesome way of kind of tarpeting attackers because when they log into this, they usually have an MO, right? If, if, I'm, if I want to own a Linux system, uh, I have my kind of standard tool set, all right, of some, binar of, of some Trojan binaries, of a rootkit, of whatever it is. I'm downloading it, downloading it from somewhere, installing it so I can have persistent access to this machine. Uh, and this is basically a, re uh, it's a small application that replays Kipo logs. So if you run this honeypot in your network and you start gathering logs of people who are really out there to get you, Again, you just need to figure out where they fit into in, in the threat uh, model that you've created. Are these just random script kiddies or is it someone that's actually trying to, uh, to hack into my, my organization? Uh, and this, this can get really funny because th they get really frustrated. There's no actual system behind this uh, and they can modify behaviors. Oh, shit. Um, <laughs> peace to you too, man. It's like <laughs> I'm going to continue the talk from... <laughs> Um, it's got like modified behavior for binary, so, so just like modified ad user that keeps asking you question and, and it's like, they get really frustrated. At some point, it's like RN minus RF. It's like, oh, fuck it, I'm just gonna delete everything. <laughs> um, but yes, you can gather, you know, actionable intelligence from this and learn about the tools and the techniques that they have been using, they would have been using on your real systems if you managed to kind of veer them into, into Kipo. Uh, artillery is another tool that, uh, that could be used for, for intelligence gathering. Yeah, not this kind of artillery. Um, read about it, it's really cool, adapt it, it's open source, uh, and this is all the plugs I'm gonna give out to Dave. Um, and as you can see, I'm, I'm focusing on the tools literally in the last three minutes of my talk because they're relevant only after you have done all the homework and, and methodology. Um, in three minutes, there's no way we can run through this. Uh, this was basically kind of an illustration of uh, how to use intelligence honeypots inside an organization. You know that something's going on, you implant false data in different locations, and you're waiting for someone to access it because you know something is breached from the inside. Um, you in this investigation, we got to a point where we actually identified the PC that was accessing it. The user didn't have anything to do with it because the PC was Trojan. Uh, again, IAVs didn't really help at that point. This is pure forensics work. And we managed to track it back to a specific criminal group that got prosecuted uh, to much to the uh, chagrin of my customer because they wanted them to keep operating to keep better trace of the money. But that's what you have to play with. Play nice with others. <laughs> He's like ready. <laughs> Play nice with others. They have lots of information and they're going through the same issues as you are. Get that data and share your experiences. Find the right channel to do that. Right? It's easy. It's not that difficult. Just talk to people. This is my obligatory Zen slide. Um, questions? It's cool. Okay. Um, and this is my call for action. Right? If you're a vendor, do shit that works, <laughs> that applies. Stop <laughs> developing firewalls and, and web application firewalls and shit like that. Start developing intelligence tools that can help us on a defensive posture. Uh, if you're a defender, focus your defenses on the assets. Okay? Uh, take the initiative, own up to your intelligence, um, and that's it for me. Questions? 
lower it, lower the thing down. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> no questions? Hi, yes. Yeah. Oh. Uh, yes. Hello. Uh, do your adversaries not use file hashing then? Do I have what, sorry? Do your adversaries not use file hashing? Do they not use file hashing? Yeah, they should. So, they should. Okay, but they and, don't. And, and the, the nice thing about it is that when you release something, you usually publish the hash with it so you can compare the download with the hash. So the post? No. Yes? The post where, where uh, someone is releasing a tool, um, they usually put like a media fire download or multiple mirrors or something and then make sure that the hash matches. Um, so, exactly. But yes, in, in for example, in the dark comet case, uh, they should have. Uh, but it's 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 almost like asking uh, the user to run an AV scan on dark comet as you download it because it might be booby trapped. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to be around drinking upstairs if you have any more questions because we need to clear the room for the next speaker, I guess. So thank you very much. Shoot.